I'm going to go ahead then um, and get started. I can still see it ratcheting up, but I better go ahead and get started. I think it's 5.01. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for joining us on this uh, special Zoom presentation. I'm going to try and answer your questions and present this information in about 30 minutes. Uh, so it'll, it'll move pretty fast. I want to thank uh, Katie Gill, who is the leader of our ownership services. Uh, she has a wonderful assistant, Courtney Jerome, who is helping her as well. You probably talk with them on the phone if you ever have questions. They're the best people to talk to that service our owners. If you ever have questions, um, send them to this email address, stock, S-T-O-C-K dot offering, O-F-F-E-R-I-N-G, at wvv.com. The chat feature on this Zoom is, is, is not functioning. Uh, that's the best way to get your questions uh, presented to them, and they're very prepared to uh, make sure that you get your answers. You know, one of the things that, um, um, well, you know, I wanted they wanted me to do is to go through the ownership benefits and explain them to all of those who are dialing in. Um, here you can see in this first image, you know, it's been a property that I've lived on for 43 years. I started 43 years ago uh, at Willamette Valley Vineyards, clearing the land, uh, planting the, the first vines uh, with the help of my industry colleagues. And here, this first image here is that's the Berno block. Those are the very first 15 acres of vines that I planted back in 1983. And I still live on the top of the hill after all these years. Uh, Jan, my wife, built this uh, wonderful home at the top of the hill. Um, and uh, so I'm only about 110 steps from the tasting room and have been for all those years. You know, here um, in this next image, uh, you can see our other winery. This is the winery that uh, my spouse uh, uh, and our project manager, uh, Jan Berno, she built our sparkling facility, sparkling winery facility. This is of course, our first, you know, full year um, in operation now there. And here you can see a picture of our shareholders celebrating the 40th anniversary of Willamette Valley Vineyards. And and this, and they're all toasting to our 40th anniversary. This gives me a chance to answer one of the questions that Katie wanted to make sure I covered. And that is, well, Jim, make sure you go over the benefits of ownership. Uh, what's the benefit of being a shareholder of Willamette Valley Vineyards that's different than owning other equities and other companies. Well, the first thing, of course, you get is the 25% discount, which is the highest you can get in our company. Uh, the owners get a 25% discount off of any bottle of wine that they purchase. So if you buy, let's say, just two bottles a month, uh, you're going to save yourself uh, over $234 or greater, depending upon the wine that you buy. And, and, and so if you are a wine enthusiast, you drink wine, you might as well own the winery because there's a real economic benefit in you doing that. Uh, and it's the highest uh, discount. Um, if you're a club member, of course, you get a 20% discount, but owners get a special discount of 25%. Of course, there's a 10% uh, off of merchandise. But then here's some of the other things you get. Uh, you get uh, a free tasting uh, once a month uh, with uh, three of your guests that you bring with you. Um, and that's at a location of your choosing uh, each each month. So that is that value is you know if it's let's say you get a nice tasting that's about a hundred dollar value for with you and three guests that's twelve hundred dollars a year. Um, and and then uh, you could you have an access to an annual blending uh, session bringing a, a total of eight people. Well, normally we charge ninety five dollars a person. So that's $760 annually in a benefit. And then for those of you who want to uh, bring, you know, guests or up to eight people, you can do a quarterly tour and tasting. Um, and uh, that's about a $40 a person value. So that's $320 a quarter or $1,280 a year. So if you tally up all these things, uh, depending upon how much wine you buy, you're around, you know, 3,400 or 3,500 or even higher in all the benefits if you want to receive them. And I know that we have a lot of uh, shareholders who live away from the winery and can't use all these benefits, but they do plan their trips. And so they'll come and do an annual barrel blending. 
um, or they will save up their wine credits um, as a preferred shareholder and then apply them to even a sweet stay, for example. And they'll save up those, uh, those wine credits over time to do that. Now, in order to be a qualifying owner, you have to buy at least a minimum of 300 shares of stock, preferred stock or common stock in the company. And, uh, and then you have to, if you buy it in the open market, which you can do, you can buy shares in the open market um, uh, off the NASDAQ. You have to prove to Katie that you've done that. You have to qualify for benefits. The only downside in doing that is, of course, you're having to pay the brokerage fees when you buy shares in the open market. Uh, you buy them from us, you don't. But you might be able to get a lower price depending upon when you buy um, in the in the market. But the, pro the problem is you'll never get the benefit of the wine credit, which is really, uh, va really valuable because it's 15% more in value than the dividend. And so we have a well, very large percentage of our owners that choose that uh, to take their dividend as a wine credit. Um, and it's a benefit to the company. It's a benefit to them. And you, that's the only way you can do it. Um, now, Katie, will uh, we provide you with a prospectus, and and we also qualify our investors to make, to find out of their their level of interest in the wine industry before we accept them and we accept their subscriptions, and that's because of the nature of our business model. But what I ask you to do is please read that prospectus because it'll explain to you this is a business, and there are farming risks, for example, there are business risks in what we're doing, and so this this investment needs to meet your family goals, your personal goals, and your appetite for this type of investment and, and the type of risk that's in our industry in this investment. The minimum shares you can purchase in this offering are 300 shares. The maximum is 500, 5,000, I'm sorry. And the reason why we're doing this small offering is because we oversubscribed at the end of September. And so we've got this small little offering that we're doing to deal with that oversubscription uh, give those people a chance to come in at the price that they missed out on, the $4.85 a share price. Um, they receive a fixed $0.22 cent per share dividend, which is the Series A preferred qualified by the SEC. So that's how that works. Now, I'm going to answer a whole bunch of questions um, as we go through this presentation. Uh, hopefully, I'll answer yours. But if I don't, don't hesitate to send us an email. We'll get you an answer. Now, here you can see this is in the Berno Estate uh, room at the Sparkling Winery, Domain Willamette. And th there's our shareholders. All they, These are all our shareholders because this is a day for shareholders in the, the Berno Estate tasting room. Um, the the uh, vineyard, of course, is the Berno Estate Vineyard. Um, and that's why this room gets its name that way. Now, here's Crystal Ashley. There's our shareholders at... Uh, uh, enjoying a presentation from Crystal Ashley. She's actually in charge of our training and development in our HR department. She's actually the former general manager of Domain Willamette, and she's teaching people how to saber. You can see that saber in her right hand. Now, this is uh, shareholders enjoying the winery at the estate uh, down in the Salem Hills. Um, and so you, they, uh, this is a, like our annual shareholder meeting. We held it all over. We, we, you could go to any, all of our locations if you wanted to. Here's a picture of our head winemaker, Terry Colton. He's the director of winemaking and vineyards. You know, he started with me back in 1997. He worked for, with me for, with me in the cellar. He was a cellar master from 1997 to the year 2000. Then he got an offer from Josh Jensen, the founder of the American of, of American Pinot Noir at Calera in California. And of course, he couldn't pass that up. So he left me in the year 2000 and went to work for Josh Jensen and has developed a, a great, incredible career in California. Uh, you know, Josh passed away now a little over a year ago. And, um, and uh, so uh, Terry is back with us um, after a 25-year hiatus. Here you can see him thieving wine out of a barrel. That's a wine thief for our shareholders to enjoy. Um, now here's a dog walk we did at Elton Vineyards and the founder of Elton Vineyards, there you can see her, Betty O'Brien with her husband now who's passed. Uh, this, they, they went out and did a dog walk event with our shareholders, which is a lot of fun. It's a beautiful vineyard, beautiful views. 
uh, worked, uh, Betty's been with us, worked with us, and is a leader in our industry over the many years. Extraordinary contributor, served on our board of directors for many, many years. Now, there's Joe Perez, one of our founding shareholders. And Joe Perez and Randy Hillier, uh, who's one of our employees and a shareholder as well, they have worked with the Cascade Raptor Center. And they get uh, these orphan juvenile barn owls, and they build these uh, houses for them all, all over our vineyards. And they get these juvenile barn owls who have been rehabilitated, uh, uh, recovered from injuries and uh, that, that kind of thing. And um, and they put them in our vineyards, which is a very natural way of looking after pests that hurt our vines, like moles. Now, here's a couple of our shareholders, Rob and Mary Peck. And here they're standing in the uh, under construction uh, tasting room and restaurant in Bend, Oregon. And one of the things that they have there, and they're talking with Elena Hammond. And Elena Hammond is the leader of our marketing team. This is a hard hat tour they're involved in. And one of the things I think that they do a lot in, in giving us really good feedback, one of the things that they do, both Rob and Mary, they, um, they are very uplifting. They uh, work positively with our employees in, in supporting and, and um, uh, coaching our employees um, in, a, in a very positive way. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the help that they give us um, in improving our operations and doing it in a very effective way, very courteous and kind and gracious way. Um, here are a couple of our shareholders, Stephen and, and Britt uh, Melbourne. What they're doing is they're stuffing cow maneuver in that cow horn. And that's because we use biodynamic farming methods. And, um, and, and this is one of the ways we develop um, a preparation a, a, that we put on the land in the spring. So we bury these cow horns with this cow manure in them. And what it does is it turns into millions of beneficial microbes that we then mix with a energized uh, water that's rainwater that's been put through a vortex and we apply it to the ground. And um, let me tell you, it makes a big difference. Uh, natural farming using biodynamic uh, principles. Uh, here you can see uh, Stephen's hand uh, reaching in and placing those cow horns. And, you know, and he's what you've done, as you can see, is he's he's put a essentially a wet or a moist soil cap so the rainwater won't intrude inside that cow horn uh, during the winter. Now, I wanted to show you this because it helps you understand why we are doing this in our business. This image is really covers a period of about 20 to 25 years. So 20 to 25 years ago on the far left, you can see what the wine industry was like. There are the wineries at the top. There you can see a funnel. There's a lot of distributors. And then you can see another funnel that opens up to a lot of stores and restaurants. And that's how it was 20, 25 years ago. Boy, things have changed. And we have to change with them. And so that's one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. Now you can see the number of wineries increasing, the number of distributors consolidating, and the number of stores and restaurants consolidating. And that's why you can see these bigger buildings, right? Those are bigger uh, retailers and restaurant chains, for example. And then in the far right, if you can kind of move my picture out of the way, um, you can see the more bottles along the top. So there's more wineries, but now they're grouped. Now there's groups of wineries. These are consolidated wineries. Large organizations have purchased wineries in groups. And so they're powerful kind of marketing supplier groups. You can see only a few distributors. There's only a few distributors left over a period of 20 to 25 years of any consequence. And then you can see a very few number of restaurants and, and um, retailers, and that's because they've consolidated greatly. You probably even heard about the recent consolidation between Safeway and Kroger's, the two largest grocery store chains in the country are consolidating. And so there's really only there. So what's happened is there is a great deal of power and leverage at retail. There's a great deal of power and leverage at, at uh, distribution or wholesale. And then amongst our wineries, there's very little power, very little leverage. And the way that wineries have dealt with that is that they have consolidated or sold out or been pushed out, you know, um, or had to sell 
And so that's what's happened over this 25 to 20 years. And so the solution is for wineries like ourselves who want to remain independent and wine enthusiast owned, the solution is to increase the number of people devoted to the winery as consumers, consumers who are owners, and to increase the amount of wine they're selling directly to consumers as opposed to through wholesale. So here you see it. Back in 2010, 15% of our revenues were direct to consumer. And now this year, they're over 50%. And we've made that change just in that period of, what, 12 to 13 years. And a large part of it has to do with what we're doing today. There we have it. There's our owners all over the country, over 26,000 of them, uh, about over 15,389 households. A lot of our shareholders are couples. So that's why you see that number. But look at them all over the country. Now, here's uh, shareholders enjoying themselves with Bill and Connie Fuller. Now, Bill Fuller is one of the founders of our industry. He was the first practicing winemaker to move from California to Oregon uh, following uh, the following prohibition, following the renewal of the Oregon wine industry. He was a winemaker at Louis Martini. The, he was the only practicing winemaker to come in that very first group. He came in, I think, 1973. And he is still making wine in our cellar. I've had the great privilege of combining our businesses with Bill um, so that we got the vineyard that he had planted back then and we get his help now. Uh, so it's a, he's a remarkable component of our success. And you can see how much fun the owners are having with him and Connie at this, uh, at this tasting. Now here you have a picture. This is um, Linda. Uh, who is an owner, and her friend, Michelle. Now, they're posing for a picture in front of one of our bill barrel blending systems. And um, this one, this one's located in the in Vancouver at the Taste Room and Restaurant in Vancouver. There's our brand, Mati. This is a Walla Walla Reds that you can blend at that location. Here's a picture of, this is Paul. He's one of our shareholders. He's got his family and friends uh, gathered there. This is in the Maison Blue uh, in Pambram Tasting Room in downtown Walla Walla, this kind of kitty corner across the street from the Marcus Whitman Hotel. Now, I had to show you this one. This is on the balcony of the Willamette Wine Works in um, uh, Folsom, California, where we have a tasting room there above Scott Seafood's restaurant in the historic district of Folsom. And you can look, see down there, there are thousands of people looking up at our patio, seeing um, NBC's voice contestant, uh, Kristen uh, Brown sing. Um, all, you know, I think it's something like, all I want for, all I want for Christmas is you. Um, and uh, here you can see that the police caught the Grinch dressed up as Santa, uh, stealing presents out of uh, Santa's sleigh down below and has marched the Grinch up through our tasting room out onto our patio deck where the Grinch uh, was the one who led the tree lighting uh, ceremony. Uh, that's the, the very, very large Christmas tree down below uh, in this, uh, in this uh, area that they turned into an ice skating rink. Uh, and so you can see the, and you look in the image, you can see the thousands of people that are there. This is a really well-located business of ours. Now, this is a picture of Bill Moore, uh, our share, one of our shareholders. He's actually in this boat, <laughs> and he took some of these pictures. And you can see these uh, Christmas ships uh, from the deck of our tasting room uh, on the Vancouver, on the Columbia River waterfront, Vancouver waterfront. Uh, we have a tasting room and restaurant there. It's gorgeous, and it has this view. Now. Um, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what's happened, right? What's happened since 2015? We've grown like a wildcat. And how is it possible that we did that? You know, there's ways of growing your business. One of the ways to grow your business is to retain earnings. And we've retained earnings. You'll see them in a minute. We retained earnings of about $22 million over the time that I first started the company. 
And then you use those retained earnings to grow, to invest back in the business. Another way to grow your business is to borrow money from a bank, and then you pay interest, and then you have to pay on the principal of the money if you borrowed, and then you use that capital to grow. The third way to grow is to take on equity. And there's two ways to do it in our company. One way is to sell common stock, which I did very early on um, to start the company. That's on the NASDAQ. It's listed as WVBI. And then it's starting in 2015. We changed our approach. We didn't want to sell any more common stock. We wanted to make sure that our common stockholders didn't lose control of the business. So what we did was we used a different form of equity. It's a non-dilutive form of equity. Like common stock, selling common stock's dilutive. It'll dilute. It'll dilute your earnings, for example, and dilute your ownership. But preferred stock doesn't do that. Preferred stock is non-dilutive. And it does pay, though, a dividend. And it has, so it's an income stock rather than a growth stock, like the common stock. And, and it has this feature in it, which is it's income producing. It pays a fixed uh, dividend of 22 cents a share. The, so there's a disadvantage to owning preferred. It's non-voting. But the, the advantage is, is that it's preferred. You have a priority in the, in the uh, distribution of the assets of the company ahead of common. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, uh, the benefits and the, and the disadvantages of, of both those uh, forms of equity. But the advantage to us is we're able to take capital and use that capital to grow without having to pay that capital back, its equity. And all we have to do is just make sure we perform for our investors. Here's all of our locations. Look at all those vineyards. Look at all the taste room and restaurants, all the way over to Walla Walla, and even down in California. Uh, here's another picture. This is, um, uh, this is actually in the Ben Taste Room, which just opened. Uh, there's Karen. And it's Mike, that's right. It's Karen and Mike Durbin. And they're with Sharon and, and Gary Fritz. On the, um, and so you can see in the foreground, Karen and Mike. And, and, and this is an, an owner exclusive event that we had. We just opened our Ben Taste Room and Restaurant. Here's a picture. It's got a bottle shop in the, in the for, front portion of that. It's right on Wall Street, the most trafficked Wall Street, uh, street in historic downtown Bend. Now, this will give you some idea of why our business model is designed the way it is. There you can see our owner's purchases back in 2010 of about, about $250,000. And you can see the total was two point, almost six million in total purchases of uh, direct-to-consumers. And look what's happened. It's risen to almost $16 million in total retail sales. And of that, our shareholders are spending over $6 million in the last year. Pretty good model. Now, here you can see 2020, 2021, 2022. Sarah McMahon of the marketing team who put these slides together sized these pie charts to the size of the revenue that our owners are contributing in purchases just over this period of time. And these different colors are from the different places in which they buy. So here's the secret sauce. This is the secret sauce of our business model in numbers. So you can see the $6 million in purchases from the owners. You can subtract the cost of goods. That's the grapes, you know, the wine making, the bottle, glass, right? The corks, the labels, foils. You subtract the commissions we pay to the ambassadors who facilitate these sales to you and support you. You subtract the dividend checks we paid out in cash. And then you can see the net contribution from the owners to operate the business. There's no business model like this that we know of in the world where the owners are making an investment, they're receiving an invest, an inv an, a benefit from their investment in growth, in income, in services, products, and they're contributing a net contribution to operating the business. So our capital really has no cost. Now here, this is a slide just to show you, this is an, a, a slide that shows the difference between a borrowing money and then paying the interest in, in principal back or selling preferred stock. And this is what happens. So if you did $9 million from a bank, that's the orange line. If you did $9 million in preferred, that's the blue line. 
and the difference between these two models in cash flow between the vectors, the end of the vectors over 15 years is $16 million. This is what makes this company so strong. This is what gives us such horsepower to grow. Um, here are our brands that we own. So you can see, of course, Willamette Valley Vineyards um, back uh, started the selling that brand in 1990 after we bottled the wine and the wine was aged and ready to sell. There's another brand we own, Elton. Uh, Domain Willamette, of course, uh, is our sparkling wine brand. Uh, we have a, we have several, of course, Walla Walla brands, Pambrin, uh, Maison Bleu, Mati, uh, Griffin Creek from Southern Oregon, Parami from the Umpqua Valley. Uh, then Natoma, right, from Folsom, California, El Dorado Hills. This is a this is in the prospectus. This is material you can read that shows you how many vineyards you own, what are the acreages of those vineyards, what our productive assets are. It's impressive. It's taken 43 years to do this. Remember, when you look at our balance sheet, these assets are on our balance sheet at the cost we acquired them not at their market value. So here, this is the harvest records we can see over time. And of course, Mother Nature produces yields that differ each year. So that gives you an idea. But you can also see just how much we're growing, how fast we're growing from these vineyard plantings we're doing. This is an example from the farm credit services that produces the value, the market value of these vineyard lands as they over time. So you can see from 2012 to 2021, how rapidly the farm values, this is bare land values per acre have risen. And these are the different sub AVAs and of the of the Willamette Valley, a number of which we own property in. Now here's a chart that gives you an idea of just how, you know, we've got what over $90 million of assets at book. You can see our long-term debt is really low, way down there. That gives you an idea that we have very low leverage in our business relative to our total growth. And you can see when I started, you know, as a company started selling wine back in 1990 and where we are today. It's a real accomplishment. And it's come from our shareholders who've driven the growth of our business. This is a vineyard we have just planted this year, Jory Claim Vineyard. You can see it from the deck of our taste room in the Salem Hills. Here's a here. Here's that you can see the winery that on the top left. Here's the plantings we're doing, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. This is a planting we're doing in the Dundee Hills. This is right across from the Stoller Winery, Stoller Vineyard. Um, and uh, here you can see Terry Colton planting the Calera clone that Josh Jensen from Calera first brought into the United States, a famous Pinot Noir clone. And there's Terry planting it in our new vineyard. This is a, just a shot to show you of our Loeza Vineyard, uh, which is uh, east of Gaston, Oregon. Um, it's in the Shahila Mountains AVA. And I wanted to point out to you that the reservoir that's down there at the bottom. It's got a big white apron on it. It collects rainwater. So we don't have to drill for water. We don't have to take water out of the river. We can collect the water that's wasted in the winter, goes out to the Pacific, but it rains on our white apron, we collect it in that reservoir, and then we drip irrigate our vines in the summer. This is another vineyard we're planting. We'll be planting this next year, Lafayette. You can see the city limits of Lafayette. It's one of our investment strategies is to buy land that will appreciate in value considerably over time. As that city limits uh, moves, uh, the value of our property will go up considerably, which is the reason why we're planting ungrafted rootstock in this location because it's much cheaper. And um, we are not sure when that uh, city limit will be uh, expanded, but uh, we wanna make sure our shareholders benefit from our decisions about where we locate vineyards uh, in this way. This is some scan data that shows what our rankings are in the United States, according to the UPC scan data that goes through those grocery store cash registers. And here you can see our case sales over time We've grown rapidly. The only thing that's constraining us right now is supply. And so that's one of the reasons why we had the largest harvest, over 4,100 tons we harvested and processed this year. 
You know, the I wanted to make sure I had answered, asked, answered uh, questions for you. I answered some of them as to why we do these things. One of the questions was, well, Jim, you know, the stock is trading on the NASDAQ at a lower price than you're presently selling it. And that's true, like 200 shares traded today. So it's 404 divided by two because they count the in and they count the out. So you could probably buy some stock a little cheaper if that's the way you do. You'll have to pay some brokerage fees to do it. But but you know back in October 18th the uh, this WBI the the uh, the stock was trading at like seven dollars and fifty one cents a share so it goes up and down um, and when we do our filings with the SEC that you're done well in advance and the price is fixed so we can't uh, change that but I wanted to make sure that you are aware that there there is a difference in those prices you know I wanted to also tell you the common stock goes to the same thing. Like the common stock, it's high point of our WBVI common stock was like on November 1st of 2021, it traded at $17.12 a share, which is exactly the same day the Nike stock hit their high of a dollar of $177.51. If you look at Nike, they're down to 119. So those shareholders of Nike lost 50, over $57 a share. So, you know, stock goes up, stock goes down. What we're interested in is we're interested in finding long-term shareholders who are wine enthusiasts, who want to contribute to the growth of their business. And, um, and, and we do have them, and they do do it, and you've seen it in the numbers. So let me make sure I've got, I've got the rest of these questions answered. One of us, when, when will the shares be issued? Well, they'll be issued after January 1st, 2024. You'll get a certificate. And yes, you can trade them after that time. Um, the remember, there's a big benefit to selecting the wine credit. You get 15% more value. And frankly, most of our shareholders do select the wine credit. And as a consequence, produce a great benefit to the company by doing so. Um, now, people have asked, well, what's the difference between a club member and owner? Well, it's better to be a club member. You get more, more advantages. You can be both and you can get the benefits of both. So be aware of that. Um, the, uh, you know, you get, as owners, you get, of course, uh, access to wines before anyone does into and priority, right, you know, uh, reservations, things like that, that, uh, and then, of course, the club members don't get that annual benefit, that annual blending benefit that's worth $760. So there's differences between the two, but we recommend that you do both. Now, I can see that we're, what, at, uh, about 35 minutes or so over I mean, 35 minutes for this presentation. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, the, uh, you know, you can uh, subscribe by the materials that Katie's going to send you. She's going to even send you a recording of this presentation. And I just wanted to let you know, I greatly appreciate um, all of you for the help that you've given in growing our business. We're only just getting started. People ask me, well, Jim, are you going to sell any more common stock? And the answer is, not likely, because we don't want the shareholders to lose control of the company. Are you going to sell more preferred? Absolutely. It's non-dilutive. Let's say you wanted to go in and, and put in a taste room and a restaurant in another city. It's about two and a half million dollars to do that if it's in leased space, uh, thereabouts. And so you have, let's say you go in there, you, you sell this preferred stock, you get about a thousand families behind the location to fund that development. And then you got a thousand families behind the location who live in the proximity of that uh, taste room and restaurant. And as you know, our shareholders on average buy over $450 worth of wine a year. And so they're really the engine that's driving our business. And so um, that's, we, our shareholders, uh, our common shareholders, common stock shareholders see the benefit of this strategy. We used to have 10 million shares authorized for preferred. Last year, the last the year before last, the shareholders authorized to raise that from 10 to 100 million shares of preferred. And so they see the, the strategy. And what we're essentially doing is when we sell preferred stock to wine enthusiasts, we're essentially increasing our market share of wine enthusiasts who are uh, contribute to the support of their business, mostly through their consumption. Also, their recommendations to their friends, they share their wines with their friends, they involve their charities with our wine and in our organization. There's always spread, they're spreading the word. There's no business quite like ours, which is why we've grown so fast. 
and why I'm confident in telling you we're just beginning. So thank you all very much. Uh, and make sure you send Katie any questions you have at stock.offering at wvv.com. I hope you have all have a wonderful holiday, especially with our wines. <laughs>